So this is Dr. Charlie Bain. Give him a big hand. Thank you, Yankee, and good to be with you. Good to be uh, here on Yankee's turf because I usually do see him in other parts of the country or he's up our way in Dallas area for our conferences. But uh, each time I run into him, get to know he and Betty a little bit more and uh, have enjoyed deepening that friendship a little bit. In fact, I could say that uh, there's nothing I wouldn't do for Yankee and there's nothing he wouldn't do for me. And that's about all we've been doing for each other is nothing. <laughs> I expect that to change, though. as we see each other more often as God leads. Good to be in Florida, which is as flat as Texas, so I feel just at home, a little bit warmer though. It's very nice. Um, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I grew up in the Washington, D.C. area in Maryland. I met my wife there and married her. Um, coming from the Washington, D.C. area, I could be of any ethnic background, you know. People often are trying to wonder and guess my ethnic background, uh, and, but they're too embarrassed to ask. So uh, I'll tell you what it is. Just by my little book in the back, it's a little blue book. It'll tell you back there my whole story, <laughs> how my grandparents came over. Um, no, I did put out some materials back there that you can look at, uh, a few to purchase, and the newsletter is absolutely free. It comes with a Bible study every three months. That's the most popular feature of anything we do on our website and send out. It's called Grace Notes. It's Bible studies about the gospel and grace. And they're used all around the world to, to train Sunday school classes. You copy them as many, many as you want and distribute them. That's what they're there for. So take a look at that and let us know where to send it. We'll be happy to do that. Well, today I'd like to talk from Romans chapter 3. You might open your Bibles to Romans chapter 3. And we're going to talk about grace because grace is uh, essential to everything we are and everything that we do. I direct now a ministry called Grace Life Ministries. I started and pastored a church in a place called Burleson, Texas, which is on the south side of Fort Worth. And when I started the church, I told them in 1986, I told them I'd stay with them for three years, thinking that they, I, I could get them established, and then I would go on to do what I really enjoy doing, which is sharing the gospel with people. So I started the church, and we went three years, and then four years, and five years, and 19 years. We met in different school rental facilities and uh, hopping from here and there. And finally, we were able to build a building, though. And we did move into a nice building. And things were going very well. I even had my nice corner office with the big windows. People were coming to the church, especially since it was a new building. Ministries were growing. Leaders were being trained. Everybody was living in harmony. Everybody loved me and my wife. And we loved them. So I quit. <laughs> I wanted to go out on a high note. I wanted to step into the ministry where my heart really was. I thought somebody else could pastor the church, but my heart has always been to share the gospel. Now that my kids are grown up, I was freer to do that and travel. So that's what I've been doing since 1997. I'm sorry, 2005. 97 is when Grace Life started, but 2005 I stepped into it full time. And what I tell people is that Grace Life shares the gospel of grace with the unsaved and the grace of the gospel with the saved. I'll let that sink in for a second. It shares the gospel of grace with the unsaved because the unsaved need to understand that God's eternal life is a free gift. And they can't be saved by their own efforts, but it has to be accepted as a free gift. And then we share the grace of the gospel with the saved because there are many Christians who go back under a performance system as if God didn't pay all the price, that they're still trying to earn his favor, still trying to please him or live up to his standard before they can be accepted, or they think they can lose their salvation. And so they need to understand the grace of God just as much. Not only are we saved by grace, but we're to grow in grace. And that's the message we take around uh, the churches and conferences in America, but around the world as well. Most of our efforts overseas are with pastors, um, a lot of work in India and Africa and other places. We'll be going to the Philippines a couple days after Christmas and teaching at the Word of Life there, training their staff and then teaching their students, their ministry students. But what is common to find there is that when we train these pastors is that even the pastors don't have assurance of their salvation. That's a big problem in the United States, but you can multiply it ten times when you go to a country like India or Africa where they've had no theological training. Can you imagine a shepherd of a church not knowing for sure that he's going to heaven? What is the message he has to share with those people? 
Usually that message is just a long list of things that they have to do to become a Christian. I've had pastors come up to me after our conferences and say, I, I am so sorry, I feel so bad for all these years. I have been keeping people out of heaven by giving them a long list of things to do. But we've had pastors come to our conference, like one in India, he came and the next day, and he went home and, and, and then came back the next morning and he said, I'm so, I, so glad I came to the conference yesterday. Last night I was able to go home and sleep in peace. See, grace brings peace to the heart because you, you understand that the gospel doesn't depend on you, it depends on God. And if you're here today and you have a troubled heart because you're not sure that you're a Christian, or you're not sure what would happen to you if you died, you don't have peace. You've had questions about your salvation. Grace is the answer for you. So we're going to look at grace in Romans chapter 3. It's a word that we sing about. It's a word very familiar to us. Amazing grace. Uh, but do we understand exactly what it means? Now sometimes it's helpful when we talk about grace to talk about um, what it is not. And so we're going to compare it to some other words that we find in the scriptures like the word justice. Justice is when we get what we deserve. You're driving too fast down the road, the policeman pulls you over, he gives you a ticket, you broke the law, you deserve justice. Now mercy though is what you would, is when you hope you don't get what you deserve. I hope the officer's having a good day and lets me go with a warning. Well that would be mercy, wouldn't it? But grace is when we get what we don't deserve. So justice is what we expect, mercy is what we hope for, and grace is our surprise. It would be like the police officer saying, where are you going? I'll give you a lift. That would be a surprise, wouldn't it? Grace is when we get what we don't deserve. When I was pastor, our youth, youth guy... Um, told me he wanted me to take him fishing. Now, I've got this tradition where I go fishing every spring. The fish come up the rivers, we fish for them, and then um, we save them and freeze them. And Memorial Day, we have a big fish fry at my house. And it's grown now to over 100 people at my house for the fish fry. It used to be, just started out with us fishermen, we would just freeze our fish, share them, and eat them together. So you had to bring fish in order to be in the fish fry. My friend heard about this, and he said, I want you to take me fishing so I can go to your fish fry. I said, okay, let's go. We went up one afternoon up the river, and uh, no sooner had we started fishing than we hear uh, a motorboat puttering up the river. And in the motorboat, guess what? Two game wardens. So they, they asked Anthony if he had his fishing license. I didn't think to tell him he needed a fishing license. I thought he knew. He said he'd been fishing before, you know, but I didn't tell him that. I had loaned him my fishing gear, okay, so he's using my gear. He says, I'm sorry, I don't have a license. They wrote him a ticket for $250. That's justice, Texas style. <laughs> but they said, sir, you may keep your fishing gear. That's mercy, because it's my fishing gear. <laughs> well, we had to stop at that point. I checked out fine. We had to stop at that point and leave because he couldn't fish any longer. So we're walking out up the river. And we walk by a fishing hole. A guy stands up with a stringer full of fish. He turns around to Anthony. He says, hey, you want these fish? I don't want them. Anthony says, yeah, man. He went and grabbed the fish and took them. And he looks at me and says, now I can go to your fish fry. <laughs> and I carried them out for him so he wouldn't get in any more trouble. <laughs> Justice is when we get what we deserve. Mercy is what we hope for. But grace is always a surprise. Grace is what sets us on the right path in the Christian life so that we can live with assurance and peace in our hearts. So that we don't always have to look back, but can grow forward. And we're going to look at what the Bible has to say about grace in Romans chapter 3, a very important passage. Now, why Romans? Romans happens to be a book of grace. It uses the word more than any other book in the New Testament, 28 times. I really believe that Romans is written to explain grace, the gospel of grace to us and show us how to grow in the gospel of grace. But we're going to land in this, this section in chapter 3, beginning in verse 21. I don't want to land any earlier because it's just talking about sin, you see. Verse 21 is a hinge in the book of Romans, a major hinge. And let's read verse 21. I'll show you what I mean. It says, but now. Okay, let's stop right there. 
but now. One of the most important, when you, when you are Bible students and you read the word but, you know there's a contrast. Here's one of the most important contrasts in the Bible. You see, for chapters 1, 11, uh, chapter 1, verse 18, through chapter 3 and verse 20, Paul has been talking about nothing except the sinfulness of mankind. The wrath of God is being poured out from heaven against all unrighteousness and wickedness of men. He goes on to describe how mankind, a history of mankind, has been to reject God and not be thankful, refuse to praise Him, to worship the creation rather than the Creator. He goes on and talks about how sin has pervaded our souls, our spirits, and blackened our minds and our hearts, and we've gotten involved in all kinds of gross immorality. I don't need to tell you. It's the history of mankind. You just look in the newspaper or watch television. Chapter 2, he talks about those who think they're better than others and says, you're condemned as well. He talks to the Jews who teach others and he says, you're doing the same things you teach others not to do. He comes to chapter 3 and he sums up the argument by saying, everyone has sinned. There's none who fear God. No, not one. There's not one good person, he says, by quoting a bunch of Old Testament passages. How true it is. And then we come to verse 21. But now, but now. This is one of the greatest contrasts in the Bible. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. You see... Today we're going to talk about what exactly is grace and why we need the gift of grace. We need the gift of grace because God's standard is too high. He says the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed. Now you see, he assumes that the righteousness of God is the standard that we must all meet in order to have eternal life, and it is. It means the upright standard of God, the perfection of God. And there is none of us that meets that standard of perfection. His standard is so high that we cannot reach it by the law. Many people view the law as a stepladder that kind of goes up into the clouds and into heaven. And by climbing that ladder, we can get closer to God and we can finally achieve heaven. The Old Testament law had 613 rungs on it if you wanted to climb them. We probably know it best as the Ten Commandments, the very core of the law, the Ten Commandments. Well, if you think you can keep 613 commandments, how are you doing with the first ten? I know you haven't murdered anybody today, right? We'll assume that. We'll start there. Uh, I, I don't know if we've committed adultery yet today, have we? Well, you see, the problem is, is that Jesus came along and interpreted the law for the Jews who thought that they were so self-righteous. And he said, you've heard it said in your heart, um, you have heard that it's been said, do not commit adultery. But I say to you, any man who lusts after a woman in his heart has already committed adultery. He said, you've heard it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. But I say to you, whoever is angry with his brother is guilty of judgment. How many have murdered somebody today? Let's be honest. Been angry with your brother without a cause. That's what Jesus said. Mental murder. Now, when we define the law not just as outward action, but inward thoughts and motives, we see that we're all guilty. If we can't keep the 10, how can we keep 613? We're hopelessly lost because we cannot keep the law. And that's why he says that no flesh can be justified by the law. God's standard is just too high. And our best efforts are just too low. You can't solve being good by, uh, by not doing bad. The efforts that we put into being good are just not good enough. And so he says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Are you familiar with this verse? To sin means to miss the mark. Everyone's missed the mark. No one's hit the target, the goal, which is righteousness of God. We've all fallen short. We've all fallen way short. It would be as if uh, we had a high jumping contest. And uh, we, to see how high we could jump. Some of us with bad knees would only jump a foot off the ground on a good day. 
Some of you younger guys would maybe jump two feet off the ground. Some of you athletes in high school might be able to jump five feet off the ground. But picture God in heaven looking down at this contest. What does he see? He said, what in the world are they doing? It all looks the same to him. Like little fleas hopping off the carpet. Our best efforts fall way short of the glory of God. And that's why we can't obtain righteousness by the things that we do or by keeping the law or the Ten Commandments. We're way too much in debt. This came home to me when I was a seminary student. I was grading papers for one of my professors at $5 an hour. And I had to have surgery. And I knew I'd be in, in the hospital for a couple days recovering, so I took my grading work with me to the hospital, figuring I could make some money while I'm there. So as I'm recovering from surgery, I start grading the papers. But my mind is distracted by the thought, I wonder how much it's costing me to be here. And I began to calculate the surgeon's fees and the doctor fees and the hospital fees. At that time, it was $50 an hour. $50 an hour, and I'm making $5 an hour. That is the definition of futility. We're trying to pay off a lifetime of sin and rejection of God by doing good things now and then. Our debt's too great. That's the definition of futility. Besides that, every good deed that we do is tainted in some way. It's tainted because our motives are never pure. So even when we do good things, we wonder about what our motives are. We see things that are done in the world. Good things are done by people who are not Christians. The Muslims can have an orphanage. The Hindus can, can take care of their, their poor. But are they good in God's eyes? Listen, anything that's done apart from Jesus Christ is not good enough to earn God's favor. Anything done to earn God's favor that rejects his provision is not good enough for him. And so our, our idea of good just isn't good enough. You remember when the ruler came to Jesus and he said, Good master. And Jesus stopped him and said, Why do you call me good? There's only one who is good. What was he saying to him? He was saying that there's only one who is good. That's God. Are you calling me God? You see, we speak of good in a relative sense, don't we? You know, you're a good guy. You're a good guy. I'm a good guy. That's because we're better than most people, maybe, on the outside. But when the Bible talks about God as good, it's talking about a perfect standard of goodness that leaves all of us in the dust. Our idea of good just isn't good enough. And yet most of the world thinks that they're good enough to get to heaven because their good outweighs their bad. But it just ain't good enough. I'm going to ask you to use your imaginations with me. I know that Yankees taught you that St. Peter stands at the gate of heaven, right? No, it's not there? Well, then use your imagination. Someone dies and he stands before the gates of heaven and he looks over Peter's shoulder and he says, boy, it sure looks beautiful in there. How can I get into heaven? Peter said, well, it takes a million points to get into heaven. And the man says, well, how do I get a million points? And Peter says, well, tell me about your life. So the man says, well, I, I went to Calvary Community Church and uh, I was an usher there for a while and I even substituted Sunday school with the seventh graders. Peter says, okay, I'll give you a point. Now the man starts thinking a little bit harder and he says, well, you know, I was, I was married and I took care of my family and I, I, I raised my children and I treated them well and I didn't kick the dog and I paid all my bills. And Peter says, okay, I'll give you another point. Well, now the man's getting very worried and he's thinking of everything that he's done. He says, well, I, I, uh, I uh, pay my taxes and... Um, uh, I hold the door open at Christmas time for the people have packages and I return my cart to the Walmart parking stall and everything he can think of. And Peter says, okay, I'll give you another point. 
Now the man is desperate. He says, there's no way I'm going to get into heaven except by the grace of God. And Peter says, the grace of God, that's worth a million points. Come on in. <laughs> it's only by the grace of God. We can't be good enough by scoring points with our good deeds to impress God. We get into heaven because God impresses us. He surprises us with his grace. So what is grace? Now you've been taught that grace, many different definitions for it. It actually comes from the word uh, gift. So it has the idea of freeness or free gift. It's a good simple definition. God's riches at Christ's expense is a good description of what grace is. I like to say that grace is everything we don't deserve for anything we need. And that applies to the Christian or the non-Christian. Everything we don't deserve for anything that we need. I like what one preacher said. He said, uh, love that reaches upward is worship. Love that reaches outward is charity. Love that stoops is grace. You know one of the Old Testament words for grace means to stoop down? has the idea of bending down to help somebody that has a need. So grace is when the love of God compelled him to do something about it, and grace is what went into action to affect our salvation. That's why he says, by grace, you have been saved. Well, again, it's often good to talk about what something is not when, you're t when we want to make clear what something is. So let's talk about what grace is not. It is not a payment for good works. In other words, we don't earn grace or it would cease to be grace. That comes out very clearly in the passages that follow chapter 3, like in Romans chapter 4. Look at verses 4 and 5. He says, Now to him that worketh is the reward, not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth in him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. He says, if you work for something, you get paid a debt. Right? But if you receive it by faith, then it's got to be by grace. How many of you received your paycheck this week, went up to your boss and said, oh, thank you so much for this wonderful gift. I really don't deserve it. How many of you thought when you got your paycheck, hey, where's the rest of it? I deserve more. When you work, you earn a wage. But if it's a gift, all you can do is receive it. And if you try to earn a gift, it ceases to be a gift. That's what the Apostle Paul is trying to say. He says it also in chapter 11, in verse 6. Romans 11, 6. And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no, mo no more grace. But if it be of works then it is no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. A little bit of a tongue twister, but what he's simply saying is that you can't mix grace and works. You can't mix oil and water. You can't mix square and round. You can't mix grace and works. If you mix grace with works, it's no longer grace. And that's why we're so adamant about a clear gospel of grace, because we live in a day where the natural a human aversion to grace wants to add something. Whether it's at the front end of salvation, you have to do this and this and this when you believe, or at the back end of salvation, if you believe, then you would do this and this and this, or you're not true, truly a believer. Grace is constantly being compromised or corrupted. And thank God that there's a clear understanding here. It's not a reward for good behavior. In other words, God doesn't uh, polish our buttons because we've done the right thing. He's not paying us back uh, for being good or giving us a reward for being good. You know, there's an idea that so many people function by in our world today. It's called karma. And uh, karma is, uh, is something that even Christians buy into to some degree. You know, you have the saying, what goes around comes around. That, that would be karma saying that. 
And so if you do bad things, bad things come back. If you do good things, good things come back to you. That's actually at the very heart of many of the Eastern religions, but many Christians mindlessly adopt it too. Now the Bible does say you reap what you sow, but it's talking about rewards in that case. But we as Christians understand that uh, grace has nothing to do with karma. Your karma locks you into a system where you've done bad things, you've got to pay the price. Grace breaks into that system, ignores karma, and saves us. Christ died when we were still sinners. Jesus justifies the ungodly. Thank God he doesn't believe in karma. And he saves us anyway. He doesn't reward us for good behavior like some religions teach. Now, he does reward us for good behavior as Christians, but not with eternal life or salvation for good behavior. And then grace is not a mutual commitment. There are many who say, well, if you promise to serve God, he'll save you. You promise to uh, surrender your life, commit your life to him, then he will save you. But God doesn't make those kind of commitments. You know why he doesn't make those kind of commitments? He knows we'll break them. He's not going to make us a promise based on what we promise him to do. How do we know that? You know, three times in the New Testament, Genesis 15, 6 is quoted. It's quoted right here in chapter 4, verse 3. Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. What happened in Genesis chapter 15 that was so important? Well, let me quickly review the story for you without going there because it's a longer story. But in Genesis chapter 15, Abraham was old and he didn't have a son. God had promised that he would have a son and he would be a blessing to the whole world. Abraham was waiting and nothing happened. And now he's getting old and he says, I'm going to have to make my servant, Eliezer, my heir. God said, Eliezer is not going to be your heir. Abraham, come outside with me and look at the stars of the heaven. That's how many descendants you're going to have. Abraham saw the stars and it says he believed God. And then it says God counted that to him for righteousness. He believed God's promise that a blessing to the whole world would come through his son, the seed, who would be the Messiah, of course, Jesus Christ. And God said, um, accounted that to him for righteousness, charged it to his account. He was declared righteous in God's sight. That's quoted three times in the New Testament, quoted here in the context of arguing against works. In other words, Abraham didn't do any works to gain eternal life. He just believed God's promise of a coming deliverer. Now what happens next is even more fascinating in Genesis chapter 15. He says, Abraham, go get a bunch of animals and, and then cut them in half. So Abraham assembles the animals, he cuts them in half and spreads the pieces. What's going on there? Well, the Hebrew word for, for um, covenant is berit, means to cut. He was going to cut a covenant with Abraham. And the implications were when you see this bloody mess and the two people who were making the covenant would walk between them. And one party would say, I promise to do this. Another party says, I promise to do that. I'll give you this piece of land if you give me 12 camels, and so forth. The idea was if you don't keep your part of the deal, it's going to be a bloody mess for you or there's going to be something bad happen. So it was a very serious covenant. So Abraham spreads the pieces out. And then what happens to Abraham? He falls asleep. God puts him into a deep sleep, and a fiery smoking pot goes between the pieces of the animals. Who's that? It's God. And God reiterates the promises. I will do this. I will do this. I will do this. While Abraham's sleeping. That's what we call a unilateral covenant. An unconditional covenant. Because Abraham didn't have to promise anything. He just had to believe what God promised. And that's the way salvation works. It started with Abraham. God's keeping his covenant didn't depend on Abraham because Abraham was a sinner. And he let God down a number of times. God repeated the covenant to Isaac. Isaac let God down. He repeated the covenant to Jacob, the schemer. Jacob let God down. He repeated the covenant to David, the Davidic covenant. Did David let God down? He promises you eternal life. Have you ever let God down? You have. And that's why it doesn't depend on you. Grace means it's all of God and none of you. Grace means all you can do is come to God with an empty hand and receive what he gives you. 
You can't earn it. You can't bargain for it. You can't make any kind of agreement. Why? Because God knows you'll let them down. The only way God knows that the promise is sure is if it depends on his word. And that's how we can know for sure we're saved. Well, you know, grace is not costly. It doesn't require our commitment, our bargaining. There's a, some Christians talk about a costly grace. Some Christians talk about a cheap grace. I don't like either term because they're all oxymorons. They, they're self-contradictory terms like, um, like military intelligence or honorable senator. Those are oxymorons. Cheap grace, costly grace, grace is free. There's only one kind of grace. There's no cost attached to it at all. It's absolutely free. It's an unconditional gift from God. How do I know that? Let's look at verse 23. I'm sorry, verse 24. We've all sinned, come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace. Justified freely by His grace. To be justified means to be declared righteous as in a court of law. God says, you're okay. How does that come to us? Freely by His grace. Are you good Bible students? All congregated down here in the front? You're thinking to yourself, well, if grace is a free gift... Why does he say freely by his grace? Well, when you see redundancy in the Bible, it means emphasis. They're good Bible students, see? Emphasis. He's emphasizing the freeness of grace because he's just been talking about those who are trying to earn it by the law. It is freely, it's in the original language, freely by his grace. Absolutely free. And so grace is an unconditional, absolutely free gift. But how can it be free? You know, every gift costs somebody something. If I send my wife flowers on our anniversary, she opens the door and the delivery man's with the flowers. He doesn't give her a bill and says, I'll sign here, Ms. Bing, and pay this. That wouldn't be a gift, would it? But she knows that if the delivery man comes and leaves her flowers, that I have paid for them. So every gift costs the giver something. What did the gift cost? God paid for it. Look at the second part of the verse. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. See that word redemption, it speaks of a price that is paid. And that, paid, that price was paid by Christ Jesus. When Jesus died on the cross, the sins of the world were placed on him. That's my sins and your sins were placed on him. And he died and paid the supreme price for all of sin's uh, penalty. And then he rose from the dead, God assuring that he accepted the sacrifice. And besides that, a dead Savior can't save anybody. So he rose from the dead to offer eternal life to all. It's hard to understand, but God's, Jesus Christ's payment was so great on the cross that when he died, he died not only for our past sins. You know, we tend to think, well, I was saved, and uh, I was saved at the age of 19, and, and God forgave 19 years of sin. But you know what? He still, still forgives our sins today based on what he did on the cross. And guess what? He even forgives the sins you'll get, commit tomorrow. Because when he died on the cross, he died not just for your past sins, but for your present sins. Now, that's mind-blowing to me. But how many of your sins were future to Jesus anyway when he died on the cross? All of them, right? It's not like you're, I'm going to do something and he's, and he's going to say, I didn't know Charlie was going to do that. I'm sorry I saved him. I made a mistake. <laughs> now, he, knew, he knows exactly what I want to do tomorrow, even though I don't. And he saved me anyway. And then some of you are thinking, well, Charlie, you just gave a license to sin. Everybody can go out there and sin because you just told them they can't lose their salvation. Well, I don't think you can lose your salvation, but I don't think it's a license to sin. I know people say that as an accusation. They said it to Paul in Romans 6. That's how I know I'm preaching the right gospel. They said it twice to him. But I've never met anybody that said, you know what? I'm already forgiven, so I'm going to go and do whatever I want. I know there's people out there, but I've never met one. But I have met thousands and thousands and thousands who have said, you know what? Jesus has forgiven me all my sins. I'm going to tell everybody about it. 
Those that understand the gospel don't abuse God's grace. They live in the excitement of that wonderful surprise. So it is free because Jesus Christ paid for it. And then we go to verse 25 as we close. Whom God has set forth, talking about Jesus, to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. Well, that's a mouthful, isn't it? Propitiation means a covering, a, satis a satisfactory sacrifice. It satisfied God's um, wrath. Jesus Christ was given as a satisfaction of, to God's wrath, as an, uh, a covering for our sins that God accepted. And it says that God had patience or forbearance because in times past he overlooked certain of our sins, waiting for that final payment to be made. And so Israel every year would offer a goat on the Day of Atonement and place their hands and uh, impute the sins of the nation upon that goat, and then they would kill that goat and send one out into the wilderness for one year. And for one year, God says, okay, you've paid the price for one year, but let's do it again next year. You see, I own a house, but I'm really lying to you. I tell everybody that the bank owns my house. You know what I mean? As long as I make a monthly payment, they let me call it my house. But if I forget, they remind me it's their house because I'm still in debt. The only way it could be my house is if one of you good people would come and just pay the whole thing off. Amen. When Israel was in debt, making their sacrifices year after year, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, came and paid the price once and for all. And that debt was settled. And the handwriting that was against us on, was nailed to the cross with him. And the eternal sacrifice saved us once and for all. Hebrews 8 through 10. Wasn't enough for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. There had to be an eternal sacrifice. What does that mean? What's left for us to do? The only thing left for us to do is accept what's been done. It would be an insult to tell God that we could do anything to earn his favor that would exceed what he has done through his son, Jesus Christ, wouldn't it? So all that's left is for us to accept the free gift. And that's why he said in verse 22, it is through the faith of Christ, which means faith in Christ. So what is faith? I like to compare faith to uh, like going to a doctor when you're not feeling well. And you, you tell him you have a problem. And so you go to a doctor you hardly know. He writes you a prescription you can't read. You take it to a pharmacist you never met. He gives you a drug you can't pronounce. But it says, take one and you'll get better. And you do. And you get better. Faith doesn't mean that you have all the answers. It means that you take somebody's word for something. You are convinced it is true. And so when Jesus said, whoever believes in me shall not perish but have everlasting life. We accept that as true. We believe it. And we're saved. So salvation is a free gift that must be accepted. And that's what makes Christianity unique among all the world's religions. Think about that. There are thousands of religions. We don't even know all they are, but I guarantee you, none of them offer what we offer. The Son of God, born in the flesh, died for sins, rose from the dead, and then gives us an absolutely free gift. You see, every other religion wants us to do something, don't they? The Jews said, you've got to keep the commandments, all 613 of them, plus they had added thousands more. The ancient rabbis had. The Muslims say, well, you have to keep the five, whole, five pillars. The Hindus say you have to keep the fourfold path of yoga, yogis, I think it's Buddhism says you have to keep the, the eightfold path. Hinduism, the four yogas. Many churches you go in, well, you've got to keep the Ten Commandments. You've got to keep the golden rule. You've got to do good things. You've got to be kind to one another. There's so much confusion, but it's all really the same thing. There's only two religions in the world. One religion says that you have to do something. 
It doesn't matter where, what country it's in or what it's called. You have to do something. There's a list. And then Christianity comes along and says, it's been done for you. It's been done for you. All you can do is accept it as a free gift. You see, so when we attach things to the gospel, say, tell people they have to do something to be saved, we just become like all the other religions of the world. But when grace surprises us as a free gift, now we've found salvation and the grace of the Bible. I'd never done this before, but once when I was teaching the Bible so in college, it was uh, for Laterno University, but they opened a college program to just about anybody, so half the class probably was not even Christian. And we had been going through the New Testament survey, and I had been emphasizing this idea of grace because I know many didn't understand it. And it came time for a final exam. Now, final exam, you know how you students get all jittery and nervous and so forth. So this, uh, I knew that they were going to be that way. But I did something I'd never done before. I, I printed out the exam that I wrote. I filled out all the answers perfectly because I knew them. I copied the exam for each student. I put each one's name on their own exam, and I graded it 100. I put them face down on their desks, and when they came in, the exam was in front of them, and then the questions began. Professor, do we have enough time? Professor, are there any essay questions? How many true and false questions? Is it hard? All, you, you know, they're so nervous. One student finally said, Professor, show us some grace, because I knew I liked grace. I said, okay, turn your papers over. They turned their papers over, and they saw their score. There was one moment of silence, and the next moment they burst out in applause and hallelujahs. I didn't expect that reaction. One said, this is the only hundred I've ever gotten. <laughs> well, if I only taught them what grace means, that was good enough for me. Some of you probably have never gotten a hundred, right? And you feel like you're still struggling to earn acceptance in God's eyes. Well, guess what? Jesus Christ gave you one hundred when he died on the cross for your sins. He gave you a one hundred. I don't care what you've done. I don't care how bad you've been. I've done those things. He gave you a 100 because he loves you so much that he gave his only son to die and pay that price. And then Jesus rose from the dead so that he could give you that gift of eternal life. If you just receive it, not try to earn it, not try to bargain for it, just receive it today as a free gift. I'm going to pray and then we'll turn it back over to Yankee. But I want to pray for you. Lord, thank you so much for each person here that you love so much. You sent your son, Jesus, for them. If they were the only person alive, you sent your son, Jesus, for them. If there's anyone struggling with assurance of salvation, not sure that you love them, may they understand what happened at the cross. May these, they be surprised by your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Said it just like I told him to. <laughs> you have heard a classic on the clarity of what grace is talking about. Thank you so much, Charlie. Something that we do and that we use here, and if you're watching by the internet, is a simple illustration that takes everything that he just said and puts it in a little format where you can clearly understand and if you're here and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior you should know by now you cannot earn it you cannot work for it and you understand that it is a free gift this hand represents you and me the wallet represents sin we all have sin on us the Bible says that God loves us but he hates our sin and the wages of sin is death eternal separation from God in a literal fire burning hell. But God says that he loves us, wants us to go to heaven. And to go to heaven we have to be perfect, as righteous as God, because heaven is perfect, God is perfect, but we're not. 
We have all sinned, and because of sin, we can't get in. So the Bible says you and I cannot earn eternal life, and all the good that we've ever done in our life, from the time we're born to the time we die, all of the good will never take away one sin. This is exactly what he's talking about. But we have something wonderful. But now, the righteousness of God is manifested. Jesus Christ is the righteousness of God. He is the wisdom of God. Jesus Christ, this hand representing Jesus Christ, He's the Lord God in the flesh. He came into the world because He loves us. He had no sin, so He didn't have to die. He lived for 33 and a half years, never sinned, didn't have any sins to pay for. So the law could not condemn Him. But because of His love for us and the hatred for sin, because it separates us from Him, Jesus Christ took all the sin of all the world for all time, for every individual, paid for on the cross, came back from the dead. And he said that if you and I would believe that he did it for us, he would put this payment to our account, and we get to go to heaven on what he did. We don't earn it. We don't work for it. It is the gift of God. I mentioned this just the other day. Of course, I've mentioned it a lot of days, but I told an individual, I says, isn't it true that you have heard all your life that Jesus Christ died on the cross and paid for all the sins of the world. I said, yeah, I've heard that. I said, if Christ died on the cross and paid for all the sins of the world, why should you or me go to hell and pay for one sin if he paid for all of them? So I don't know. I says, because you don't believe he did it for you. When you believe he did it for you, that payment he made is put to your account, and you get to go to heaven, not because of what you did, but because of what he did. And he says that he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. You see, if I offered you this microphone and you accepted, you would have a microphone. And if I offered you my wallet and you accepted, you would have a empty wallet. If Christ walked in here right now and offered you eternal life and you accept it, what would you have? Eternal life. And if it's eternal life, it would last forever. And if it lasts forever and all your sins are paid, where would you go when you die? To heaven. So can you know you're going to heaven before you die? Yes. That's what it's all about. And it's all because of God's wonderful, yes, surprising grace. The day I trusted Christ as my Savior, I was 18 years old in a little old living room in Athens, Georgia. And I knew that if what my father-in-law told me was true, I'm going to hell. And when he explained how I could have eternal life and know that I could go to heaven, I was totally surprised. I did not know that. I had never heard that. Best news in all the world. Let's pray, shall we? With every head bowed and every eye closed and no one looking around. If you're here this morning, or if you're watching by internet, this is the only thing you need to do. Because, see, there's a God in heaven who sees you, who knows everything you've ever done, and he loves you. And he died on the cross to pay for your sins. And if you will trust Christ as your Savior, then he said he would save you. Save you, that means he saves you from hell and gives you eternal life. And you can know that you're going to heaven when you die. And I'm going to ask you in just a moment to raise your hand. Raising your hand doesn't save you. I'm not going to have you stand up or come forward. I'm not going to embarrass you in any way. But I'd like to know that if what was said, that it made sense to you, and that you will trust Christ as your Savior, and I'd like to know, and I'd like to have prayer for you. So is there anyone at all say, yes, that made sense to me, and I will trust Christ right now as my Savior. I want to be certain of going to heaven, and I will trust Christ right now. And pray to you, would you pray for me? Would you slip in very quickly and put it right back down? Is there anyone at all? Anyone at all? If you have trusted Christ as your Savior, you're God's child, you have eternal life, you're going to heaven when you die. The greatest thing you can ever do is to share that good news with someone else. Our Father, we thank you so much for all you've done for us. We're thankful for the opportunity you've given us to come together and to hear Dr. Charlie Bing give a tremendous message on what grace is. And we ask now your blessings upon each person here. And we pray that you'll bless those that will be leaving by plane today and going back to their homes. We're thankful for the good time we've had with the open house. And we pray, Lord, for great things to be done next Sunday and 
with the cantata and the, the meals and all those things that has to be done. We ask now your blessings upon the service tonight. We just thank you for